okay. Um, so let's get started. So now it looks like my video is gone again. Um, not sure why. You can see me? Okay, cool. Then I'm not gonna worry about it. Um, um, one second though. Great, so today we'll talk about um, dimensionality reduction um, and particular PCA discriminant analysis and manifold learning. So, um, these are quite different techniques with um, different goals somewhat, but um, they all sort of go under the bigger umbrella of dimensionality reduction. Of those, uh, PCA or principal component analysis is definitely the most uh, commonly used one, and that's what I wanna start with. So this is now actually starting at the part of the lecture that will talk about um, some unsupervised learning methods. So it's, I think it's gonna be only um, Today and in the next lecture, we're going to talk about uh, clustering. And so this is uh, quite different in that now um, we're basically given just a data set and um, no targets for uh, at least for most of this lecture. So as usual, I have a 2D visualization of, uh, of what the algorithm does. So here um, I'm trying to illustrate principal component analysis. And in the first picture, we can see um, a blob of data. It's like a Gaussian blob that's elongated in some direction. The idea of PCA is to find the directions with maximum variance. And um, so this is the directions in the data for um, in which the data is stretched the most or um, that explain most of the variance in the data. And so I will talk a little bit more about what this means mathematically uh, in a little bit. But so here, the, first, the idea is that you find the first component that has the most variance in the data. Um, basically, the way you do this is you fit a Gaussian and then you look at the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. Or basically, you find the largest eigenvector of the covariance matrix. So this is called component one here. This would be the first comp uh, principal component, the component um, that explains the most variance in the data. And um, you can then, um, after you found this, you can um, remove this component from the data and you can try to find again the direction that explains the most variance in the data. Um, in PCA, you will always find orthogonal directions and um, in 2D, there's only one direction that's orthogonal to component one, and this would be this one. If you're in a higher dimensional space, there's infinitely many uh, orthogonal directions, and you can iterate the process and find the, um, the direction uh, that has the second most variance. So here, basically, if in 2D, if we find the first components, we're kind of done because um, by being orthogonal, the second component is already uh, defined. Um, so having these orthogonal components basically defines a basis of, um, or an alternative basis of the space. And um, because they're orthogonal, we can think of these as being a rotation of the space. And so uh, here in the second plot, I show um, the data after it has been rotated so that uh, the x-axis is now the first principal component and the y-axis is the second principal component. And so this is the same data just rotated. And principal component analysis basically finds this rotation of the data. This is not yet dimensionality reduction in that uh, we just rotate the data. So this is a lossless uh, process and um, it's still the same dimensionality. But now the first, um, the X axis here is the dimension of the um, most variance. And so we can think of this as containing the most information and the second um, containing less information. And so the way principal component analysis is used for dimensionality reduction is keeping only the first K components. In this case, maybe we want to keep only the first component because there's only two dimensions. If you project only on the first component, this means only 
projecting on the um, x-axis here, this is what the data would look like. And so, I mean, this is just a 1D plot. And so, um, basically, we would just drop the data, uh, the, uh, the second component, and just have a 1D representation of the data. And the way this projection is done, basically, first the rotation, then project, projecting on the axis, this will give us a new representation of the data that's one dimensional, but it tries to capture as much, much variance as possible. You can, um, ah, I was gonna say this, so the, the color here doesn't really encode anything in the plot. The color is just to show you how the data is being transformed. Um, I mean, you can think of this as a regression data set in the color encoding regression, but the point is just uh, to show you where each, uh, each dot ends up in, in the rotation. And um, so after you uh, drop the second component, you can think of um, how much data did you lose by doing this. And one way uh, to figure out how much data you lost is by trying to rotate the data back into the original space. So uh, if we do PCA for dimensionality reduction, um, this uh, third picture here at the bottom left would be uh, the representation we used. So we only had went from 2D to 1D. But if we want to understand uh, what did we lose by going to one dimension, we can rotate back in the original space. Um, and in the original space, we basically projected on this line of the first component, and we lost everything in the direction of the second component. However, if you um, look at the original data and compare it to the reconstruction down here, we see that we captured still the essence of the data, even though we throw away um, basically one whole dimension of the data set. So I want to go a little bit more into um, how these uh, principal components are calculated. So um, one way is um, using the reconstruction. And um, this basically says that um, we want to find a, a different representation of the data set that I call x prime here, so that the uh, rank of x prime is some fixed number r. In our case, r would be 1. We want a one-dimensional representation. And so that um, the distance from x to x prime is minimized. So this basically says, I want the most faithful representation of my data that is rank R. Rank R means it lives on an R-dimensional subspace. And so here, if we want to find the most um, accurate representation of this original data set that is uh, one-dimensional, we would come up with this lower right-hand corner. So this is one way to think about PCA is finding a, a lower dimensional representation that is as accurate as possible. Another objective is, um, sorry, um, is by, um, so this is the more usual objective, is by talking about um, the variance. And so, um, as I said, you can formulate PCA as the direction of maximum variance. And so the optimization problem you would solve here is um, that um, you want to find the direction U1 in the uh, input space that, um, say, has a fixed norm of 1, but so that the variance of U1 times x is maximized. So that says you have a vector of length one, so that the variance of, if you look at uh, this projection of the data is maximized. This would be the definition of the first principal component. And um, if you write down the, what the variance means, um, then you can see that this is the same as a U1 transpose times the uh, covariance of X times U1. So this is, now here, the covariance is just a covariance matrix. And um, so the, the second optimization problem is very easy to solve. 
um, by looking at the eigenvector. So this is like a very classical uh, uh, like theorem in linear algebra that you can optimize this by uh, finding the eigenvector uh, with the largest magnitude eigenvalue. So what we're doing is we're computing a covariance matrix, and then we compute the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. Alternatively, we can also directly compute um, the singular value decomposition of um, uh, the matrix X. Oh, but so this is like sort of the more obvious way to see uh, if I want a direction of most variance, then I need to look at uh, the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix. This is only for the first principal component. As I said, you can then iterate by um, computing the first principal components and subtracting that from the data. So that would be the project, would be basically the residual. Um, so you subtract the projection, the first principal component, and you apply the same optimization problem again, and this will give you the second principal component. Oh, one thing I should mention is that the components are only well-defined up to a sign. So I plotted the component one into the, uh, as pointing into the lower right hand. I could have easily also uh, plotted a component as pointing to the uh, top left, and the same for component two. So um, the direction and the length is well-defined, but sort of the, the sign of the direction is not well-defined. And this is the same as you probably know from eigenvectors. So if I compute the eigenvectors to the covariance matrix, um, if I change the sign, I will still get an eigenvector of the covariance matrix uh, with the same eigenvalue. And so um, this means that if we compute uh, principal components, basically whether you take the principal component or the negative of it is arbitrary, and it's sort of an arbitrary outcome of the optimization procedure uh, if you get this direction or this direction, and you shouldn't count on either of them. So while this is sort of the, the standard way to think about PCA, the way that uh, it's usually comp computed is um, using a singular value decomposition. And so in the singular value decomposition, as you know, um, or uh, hopefully remember from linear algebra optimization, is you compute the uh, decomposition of the data into an orthogonal matrix that's um, number of samples times number of samples, um, a di a diagonal containing the singular values, and then uh, orthogonal matrix that's n feature times n features, which con uh, contains the component vectors. And so this is basically the representation um, that uh, PCA computes. So here, um, V has the uh, uh, component vectors. DV is the component vectors times their length scale. So usually you would think of DV as the components and U would be the projection of X onto these principal components. And um, if you want to do dimensionality reduction, you would drop the parts of V that correspond to the smallest eigenvalues. Um, one, uh, so you can use PCA um, as said, so you can use this for dimensionality redu reduction. Um, you can just use the rotation that will give you new um, a new feature representation. Um, another thing you can do is you can use it for what is called whitening. Um, I'm, I didn't put the formula for whitening on here, but uh, this is a visualization of what happens. Uh, in whitening, what you basically do is you compute the uh, principal uh, component analysis, and um, then you um, rescale the uh, components by the inverse of their eigenvector, or the um, sorry, inverse of the eigenvalue. What this basically means is you're doing um, um, a standard scalar on after the PCA. So here, if you do the PCA rotation and then you do a standard scalar, then you get what's called the whitened version of the data. And so in the whitened version of the data, this basically makes the data look as much of a ball as possible. 
Uh, this is something that is used uh, commonly for feature extraction. Um, I think we'll see an example of this later on uh, some cases. But uh, basically, if you do dimensionality reduction with PCA, what you're saying is the directions that have um, small variance will be um, uh, are unimportant. Whereas with whitening, you're basically saying the opposite. You're saying all directions of variance have the same importance. And so this depends on sort of what your view is of what these components mean. If you're just interested in, uh, in reconstructing the original data and representing the original data, then whitening might not make a lot of sense. If you think the PCA directions capture interesting structure in your data, then um, whitening makes sense. All right. So that was, uh, I think, enough for now on sort of the uh, basic theory and math behind PCA. Now I want to talk a little bit about some use cases. So the first use case, why is it called whitening? Um, it's from signal processing. Basically, it makes it look like white noise is the one sentence explanation. Um, but it's basically using uh, slang from signal processing. So in the context of machine learning, uh, it, it's a little bit weird to call it that. But, um, um, the question does uh, whitening create an effect of scaling? I mean, whitening is basically scaling the, da the data after the PCA transformation. So if you go back to the original PCA, a that I had here, this is just a PCA rotation. And so if you, um, so this is like an elongated blob now because it was a Gaussian and we rotated it so that the axes of the Gaussian are al aligned with the axes. If we then scale it, that means we basically give each of the components the same amount of importance. That's the same as running it through a standard scaler after the PCA. So it's scaling, but it's not scaling in the original space. It's scaling in the transformed space. All right. So one of my, um, oh, give me one second. Thank you. Sorry. I may or may not have spilled my coffee just now. Um, all right. So um, one relatively common use case is visualization. So here I'm using the um, breast cancer data set. So this is a binary classification data set that, um, oh, I don't know, has like, um, do I have the dimensionality? I don't think I have the dimensionality here, but it's like something like 20 maybe or something like this. And so if I have a uh, data set of this dimensionality, then um, obviously I can't easily visualize it. I could visualize it using a, a scatter matrix, and then I would have number of features times number of feature many scatter plots. This would be a lot of scatter plots for this data set. However, if I um, use PCA, I can reduce the dimensionality of this data set to um, bring it down to two dimensions. And given the definition of PCA, the way I bring it down to two dimensions is it will give me a rotation and a projection that is most faithful to the data. So the definition of PCA is give me the linear transformation of the data into two dimensions that uh, allows me to best capture the variance in the data. So this is a pretty natural way to look at the data. So um, now in this projection, the, both the first and the principal component analysis are a mixture of all of the input features. So here, um, I'm showing how to do this with uh, scikit-learn, of course. Um, so I import PCA, and um, I say n components equal to two. That means compute the two uh, principal components. Then I call fit transform. I could also call fit and then transform, um, but fit transform is just a computational shortcut. And uh, afterwards, it, the um, data will be two-dimensional, and now I can plot the two dimensions. What I'm also doing is I show the component vectors. And so they are shown here on the right. 
And um, so the component vectors, I, so a principal component is a vector in the original input space. So it means there's one entry for each feature. And so the thing indexed with zero is the first principal component, the thing indexed with one is the uh, second principal component. And so each of them has an entry for each feature vector. So actually this, this um, visualization already shows a quite nice separation of the classes. However, if I look at the component vector, I see that basically only two features really participate. So most of the entries are around zero, but uh, the mean area and the worst area are the ones that um, have really high values. And so um, basically I'm looking at a space that's only spanned by these two features. So this is uh, maybe a little bit surprising. And, but the reason why this happens is that uh, I did not scale my data here. So if I do PCA, it's quite important to scale the data first because if I rescale any dimension, then this dimension obviously um, Um, so zero is the first principal component, one is, is the second principal component in the plot. Um, so if I scale, if I rescale a, um, uh, a feature, then this feature will obviously have much more variance. The variance in the feature scales linearly with the scale, like the variance is the scale of the feature, right? And so if I find the direction of maximum variance before scaling, it will depend very strongly on the actual scale of the feature. So if I do um, standard scaling before, um, then I actually get quite a different plot. So here I scale the data and then I do PCA. And so then I get actually this plot, which uh, shows a nearly perfectly separation of the two classes. So I can see that even without doing any supervised learning. So the PCA was computed com uh, completely without knowing what the classes are. I use the classes only in the visualization. I can see that um, the two classes are very easy to separate. And if I now inspect the components again, so here I, I come do the IMP show on the components, I can see now many more of the components um, uh, participate in the principal component analysis, so all the values are sort of uh, non-zero. And so the first principal component and the second principal component, they all are basically a complex mixture of all the features. And so um, there's actually, there's a, a different way to um, visualize the principal components that's I think um, used in econometrics, maybe a little bit more. I don't usually use it a lot, but I still wanted to show it to you. So a different way to um, visualize the components on the left-hand side um, is that, um, so here, um, I mean, this is a two by number of features uh, matrix. An alternative way to visualize exactly the same number is uh, the scatter plot. And so um, here the x-axis corresponds uh, to the entry here in zero and so the first principal component and the y-axis corresponds to the second principal component. And so in a sense, um, if we think back to what I said about visualization, the thing on the right-hand side is, uh, uses position instead of color. And so it's a much better visualization than the thing on the left-hand side. But I find the thing on the right-hand side a little bit hard to understand because now the points are the features. So the rows in this matrix here are the features and it tells me how much each feature is part of each principal component. So it tells me that the first principal components uh, captures worst parameter and mean parameter a lot the first principal component doesn't capture texture error that much. Whereas the second principal component uh, captures smoothness error a lot, um, but it doesn't uh, capture uh, mean radius. 
All right, so, uh, so this um, components underscore, um, as I showed, this contains the components. So this is, uh, so the principal component analysis is basically just a matrix multiplication with this components vector. So visualization is um, one use of PCA and it's like one that I find uh, yeah, quite useful if I do exploratory analysis of the data. Um, another common use for PCA is regularization. This is something that in particular, if you're interested in, um, in inference, so this is a very common technique in statistics, uh, you can use PCA to get rid of collinearities of your data. Um, so we, we discussed when we talked about linear models that if you have collinearities in your data, then standard uh, linear regression will not work. If you have many more features than you have samples, then uh, standard linear regression will not work and you need to regularize. However, regularization impacts the interpretability of your components, uh, sorry, of your coefficients. If instead you um, run PCA, uh, PCA allows you to um, reduce the dimensionality of your data and basically remove uh, collinearities. So you can use PCA as a pre-processing step before you do linear regression, and then you can do plain old linear regression. And so I'm doing this here. So basically I'm using logistic regression where I turn off the uh, regularization by setting the C parameter very high. And um, you can see that the training score is uh, much better than the test score. Whereas if I uh, do a PCA to two components, then um, this will, so this is again on a cancer data set, this will um, uh, reduce the dimensionality to two. So this will, uh, mean the logistic regression only has two coefficients now before it had like whatever 16 or something like that and um, uh, so it's much more restricted because it needs to live in this two-dimensional subspace and i can see that well if i only use two components uh, both training and tests are go down quite a bit because i regularized quite a bit i can um, could now run cross-validation to find what is the best number of components to use um, and um, uh, find a, a good way to regularize using PCA this way. Uh, another way to look at this is look at the variance coverage. So this is also known as a spree plot. In uh, scikit-learn, there is a, an attribute called uh, explained variance and explained variance ratio. And um, so the explained variance ratio says, if I keep the first, or sorry, how much of the variance is explained by each of the components? And so you can see here that say like 40% of the variance is, um, sorry, my monitor setup is a little bit weird. 40% of the, uh, uh, the variance is explained by the first component. 20% is uh, explained by the second component. Uh, about 10% is explained by the uh, third component and so on. And so um, you can manually specify a cutoff by uh, looking at a kink in the number of components. Uh, so this is a linear plot of the covariance covered. At the bottom, there's a logarithmic plot. And um, so, Usually you have an exponential fall off in the variance that is covered by each component. And so it's often more useful to uh, look at the, um, at the logarithmic plot. And so you can definitely see the logarithmic plot. There's like a king here. So, um, so actually, oh, the data set is like maybe 28 dimensional and, um, but at tw uh, 29 dimensional. But actually at 26, basically all of the variance is covered and the other dimensions are like add very, very little information. So this is basically shows that there's um, one, two, 
three dimensions that are collinear with the rest of the data. So if I wanted to be very conservative and I want to preserve a lot of information, maybe I could use 26 dimensions and I would preserve nearly all of the variants. Um, I could do a cumulative plot here as well and will probably show me that if I keep the 26 um, components, I will get 99.9% .9 of the variance covered or something like this. Um, if I want to actually regularize my model, obviously I'm not dropping that many components if I drop here. And um, so I, I looked at this and said, well, there's a there's sort of a visible kink here in the, if I just look at the Senate variance, maybe there's even a little bit of a kink here if I look at logarithmic. And so I tried a number of components equal to six, and it actually gave me a pretty good result um, of a tested error of um, 96% which is better than uh, not using PCA for regularization. So I didn't, um, I didn't compare this here with um, using L2 regularization. So this would be an alternative to uh, using L2 regularization that um, doesn't introduce bias. So if you're interested in inference, if you're interested in doing uh, statistical analysis, if you use um, L2 regularization, um, by setting C to some value that's like finite, basically, uh, you will, your estimates will be biased. If you use PCA, because PCA is completely unsupervised, your estimate will uh, not be biased. Okay, a question is, how did you get this variance covered plot? Um, it's PCA dot um, invariant, so, sorry, uh, dot explains the variance ratio. So that's an attribute that's just a 1D vector that has the length number of components. And so I've just plotted this 1D uh, vector that gives me for each component how much variance does it cover. And then for the second plot, I just set the axis to log. Um, yeah, maybe I should have included the, the, the code for this, but it's just a single line. It's plt.plot pca. Explained variance ratio. Yeah, and as I said, you could obviously do a uh, grid search instead, but I just want to also show this plot. So this plot uh, is useful to show you uh, also complex collinearities. So looking at a 28 dimensional data set, it's uh, very hard to see if there are collinearities, but you can see here that um, basically, yes, there are. So um, now if I did this, um, just logistic regression, I said this is nice to um, get potentially more interpretable coefficients. However, now um, this logistic regression that I trained here will give me um, a vector of size six. So it's a six dimensional coefficient vector that is in the rotated space. So it's in the space, in the PCA space. So it's very hard to actually interpret this coefficient vector. Um, however, I can use the inverse transform of the PCA. So I can take out the logistic regression and I take out the PCA from my pipeline that I fitted. I run the inverse transform on the coefficients and this will basically undo the rotation and the projection done by PCA. And um, so here now I'm plotting the coefficient in the original space um, with using PCA and rotating it back to the original space and without using a PCA. Um, and so, I mean, basically I'm just trying to show that they are actually, they're quite similar in some aspects, but they're not uh, the same, obviously because we regularized in some way. Um, okay, I should probably speed up <laughs> given that we are half through lecture and I already, and I'm only at slide 13. Um, anyway, so but one thing, you, so PCA is uh, quite useful like this. However, you should keep in mind that PCA is unsupervised. And so um, you can lose information in the data if the information is uh, part of the class information and not really uh, apparent from just a distribution of the data. I think this is rare in practice, but it can like trick you. Um, so if I look at this data set here that I created um, 
synthetically to uh, mess with PCA. Um, the data looks like it's just noise. So there's two classes here, but the classes overlap a lot. If I look at my scatter plot, it looks like um, they just, um, it's just very noisy. If I look at the PCA, then you can see that the first two components are actually complete noise, but all the information is in the third component. However, if you would look at how much variance is in the third component, the way I scale the data, the third component is basically this component that points in this direction. There's very little variance. So if you look at just a PCA, you would say, oh, it's very, I can definitely drop this third component. It's not important at all because it comes very little variance. However, it actually contains important class information. So you might lose important class information by dropping any, um, by, by dropping any components um, because PCA is completely unsupervised. However, this is sort of more of an edge case that I constructed uh, to show that PCA can fail. Um, all right, so we have PCA for visualization, PCA for regularization, and finally, I want to talk about uh, PCA for feature extraction. So this, uh, this example is also in the book. Um, so this is um, how feature extraction, sorry, how face recognition was done in like uh, maybe 2002, pre-neural networks. This is not what you would do now, but I think it's still an interesting example. And I often, if I have um, a new data set, the first feature extraction I do is PCA because it's much, much easier to understand and much faster and has much less parameters than uh, trying to do some fancy deep neural network. So I would, if I have a new data set, I usually would do PCA as my first feature extraction stage just to figure out what's going on. Um, so here I'm using the labeled faces in the wild data set, and uh, which is like people that were famous in the 90s, I think, um, or maybe even earlier than that. So it's politicians and um, actors. Mostly, I think, um, it was people that are in newspapers. And so I do principal component uh, on this. And so now um, I think of each image as a grayscale vector. So I flatten out each image as a long float vector. And then I run the principal component on this. And um, this works because the faces are relatively aligned. And I get the principal components I see down here. Um, so another view of principal component analysis that is not like in addition to like the having the rotation view is thinking of it as an additive um, decomposition. So you can think of it as each image here being represented as a linear combination of the components. What this means is that each um, each face is represented as a sum of all of uh, these components. For, in the case of faces, these guys are called eigenfaces. Um, so it's a linear combination of the first principal component plus some coefficient times the second principal component plus some coefficient times the third principal component and so on. And so now I can think of these coefficients as features of my data set. And um, if we, so looking at these components first, uh, remember that um, the sign doesn't mean anything. It's very hard to not look at the sign because of such a strong um, visual cue. But um, we can uh, maybe start to interpret what these uh, what these components mean. And so some of the things are relatively clear. So this one here, uh, the second principal component is like a brightness differential on the whole phase between left and right. Um, the third component maybe is a differential between top and bottom. The fourth component is like black background, it's like a contrast differential between is the background brighter than the face or the other way around. And then here's the background on the left or on the right brighter. Um, and so uh, some of these have sort of um, at least uh, some, some interpretation so you can see, well, maybe these components are not actually that informative in about what this person, 
who this person is, they mostly capture the illumination. Um, but still, people found that these features are uh, useful for classifying pictures. Um, so the question is today, could you use PCA for computer vision as a baseline measure? So one of the things you can, um, should keep in mind here is that this only works because the faces are aligned. Um, so someone used a face detector to crop out these faces. And you can only extract these because um, the eyes are in the same place in each of the pictures and um, the mouse is in the same place. PCA does not know about the two-dimensional layout of the image. PCA doesn't know about translation in the image. And so unless you, if your data is highly aligned, which is often the case for medical images, for example, you could definitely use this as a baseline. And like if you have like aligned x-rays or aligned images of an iris, you could look at the PCA components and like run a classification on them or just look at them. Um, but if your images are not aligned, so if, they are tr if there's some translation aspect to it, then um, it will not work at all. Right, so um, I'm going to show that at least if I use one year's neighbor classifier, then um, Uh, using the eigenfaces is better. If I actually use a more complex classifier, it doesn't make that much of a difference. But if I use um, one nearest neighbor, then um, actually the classification rate get, get better if I use PCIS feature extraction. And so here I'm using the labeled faces in the while. So this is like a, there's many classes. Um, there's 1,500 samples. Each of them is um, 5,600 dimensional vector. So this is the number of pixels in the image. If I just run k-neighbor classifier with number of neighbors equal to one, I get an accuracy of 0.23%. Actually, this data set is highly imbalanced, and so accuracy is not a good measure. But uh, let's let's skip over this for for now. And um, if I um, do PCA with 100 components. Basically, I transform from this uh, 5,000 something dimensional feature space to a 100 dimensional feature space. And if I do one nearest neighbor in, um, in this space, then um, my accuracy goes up to 31%. Here in this case, because I'm using PCA as a feature extraction method, I'm using white and equal to true. So I did cross validation. I tried white and equal to true, white and equal to false, and then found it white and equal to true gives me better results, uh, which makes sense because it basically means I'm scaling after I'm doing the PCA and uh, k neighbors classifier is very scaling, very, uh, very scaling um, dependent. It also makes sense because if we thought of like the first couple of components, maybe they uh, captured illumination. And so these are probably, we don't want to upweight the illumination ones. We want the illumination probably not to count as much as other aspects of the face. And so whitening, which means uh, keeping all of the dimensions uh, or give all the dimensions the uh, same weight makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. We can also look at uh, the reconstruction um, to understand what the different number of components mean. And uh, so here is the reconstruction, meaning the, uh, doing the inverse transform. So this is doing transform and then inverse transform. So rotating, projecting on the first K components and then rotating back to the original space. Um, on the left-hand side, we have the original image then the reconstruction with 10 components, 50 components, 100 components, and 500 components. And you can see that with uh, 10 components, you get a very, very blurry version of the image. Um, and you can definitely not recognize the person. Um, maybe with 100 components, you can make somewhat recognize the person. And um, with 500 uh, components, you get a somewhat noisy version, but um, most of the information is preserved. Um, one of the things you can see here is that uh, with the less components, so this guy here, I don't know if you recognize him. Um, he is just a blurred version of himself, whereas these are like, look very weird. This is because 
they have different rotations of their faces so, um, that are not that common in the data set. And so they're hard, so the PCA has a problem um, in making this rotation work. So um, also, you know, there's imbalance between what kind of people are represented in the data set and so on. And so there's lots of old white guys in this. And so uh, PCA has an easier time reconstructing another old white guy. Oh, in case of images, the maximum component would be the dimension of the image, right, is a question. And so in general, the maximum number of components is the maximum, is the, um, is the rank of the input matrix. Here in this data set, let me go back, we actually get 1,547 samples and six, um, and five, 5,600 features. Actually, the maximum number of components would be the minimum of these two. So it would be 1,547. So in this case, it would actually be limited by the number of samples. That's because in, in the data space, if there's only um, that many points, um, you can't span a 2,000 dimensional subspace by only 1,500 points. So you're trying to find origin, um, orthogonal components in the data space, but you can't find more components than you have data points. Because you could, if, if I um, maybe think about it differently, if I allow myself to have 1,547 components, I would certainly perfectly reconstruct every image. I can reconstruct every image with zero error. Like I could, this is, this is not what happened, but imagine I would um, take each image as a basis vector. They're not orthogonal, but let's say we can make them orthogonal. I can, if I use every image as a basis vector, I can certainly reconstruct all of them. So I will, I can, uh, and if I can reconstruct all of them, there's no point in adding more components. But usually the um, maximum number of components is the, dimension, uh, is the dimensionality of the data. But uh, if you have less samples than features, then the number of samples is the maximum um, dimensionality. Um, you can also do PCA for outlier detection. Um, so um, by looking at which ones are the uh, are reconstructed worst. And so um, in this data set, you can um, see that these spaces are reconstructed well and these spaces are not reconstructed well. And you can see that this um, mostly has to do with the alignment of the face. Um, so here there's like people having glasses, people having hats, and then people having their shirt in them and weird crops. Um, and whereas if you're like really, really aligned like this, then you can be reconstructed well. All right, I think there was enough uh, waxing on about uh, principal component analysis. And I wanna talk about um, discriminant analysis next. So discriminant analysis is actually a supervised technique. So it's a, a classification technique that's like very classical. I think it uh, predates logistic regression. So this is also known as, um, so the first one is linear discriminant analysis, also known as Fisher's discriminant analysis. So this is from Fisher, uh, the same Fisher that like invented half of statistics. Um, and, uh, this is, uh, you can think of this as sort of a probabilistic classifier where um, you model the probability of um, the class Y being K given X. This is what you want to classify, right? You want to um, uh, figure out what's the probability of Y being given class given your features X and uh, use base formula for that. And um, with base formula, you can turn this around to P of X given Y equal to K, uh, P of Y equal times the probability, the prior probability of the class divided by the probability of the data as a whole. And so this is sort of a standard approach for doing um, what's called generative probabilistic uh, classifiers. And so um, the only thing you really need to specify here is this guy. If you specify the model 
for any one class. So this is P of X given Y equal to K. Then you get a classifier using this formula. This data, this here is just the frequency of um, the class K and you divide it by the sum over all classes. And so basically if you specify this model, then you can, you can get a probabilistic classifier um, using this model per class. This is a similar approach to, uh, or this is the same approach as naive base does. Naive base then makes even more assumptions about this form. The form that um, Fisher's experiment analysis takes is it says each probability distribution for each class is a Gaussian, a multivariate Gaussian. So I wrote down the formula for multivariate Gaussian. And so you have, um, in Fisher's experiment analysis, you have one mean per class K, but they all share the same covariance matrix. So, um, so you assume that each class is a Gaussian blob. They all share the same covariance matrix, but each has a different mean. And um, if you make this assumption for each class, then you can run through the math, which is in the line above here, and you get a classifier. And uh, it turns out this classifier is actually a linear classifier, which is like maybe not super obvious to see, but I think I tried to, um, Um, show it here. Oh yeah, so oh, I just added the last line. So basically, um, this actually just shows as a linear classifier, the log odds, so, which is the thing that uh, is modeled in logistic regression as well, the log odds of P of Y being equal to K divided by P of Y uh, equal to L is, um, so this is zero. So this is the decision boundary between class K and L is um, mu k minus mu l um, times the inverse of the covariance matrix. And so um, what this means is that the decision boundary is just, so this is a linear vector. The decision boundary is just uh, linear in x. And so this is, um, and you can see how basically this is um, what, what you're doing is oh sorry there's an x missing over here you so what you're doing is you're basically you're projecting on the line so or you're you're like um you're rotating uh, by the covariance matrix, and then you're projecting on the line that's spanned by the means of the, of the two classes. And so this gives you a linear classifier. So this thing is um, nice for several reasons. Um, so this is like basically the oldest classifier there is potentially. Um, and I didn't really talk about it as a classifier because it's not that great as a classifier. I would usually use logistic regression but it is interesting because it um, estimates this covariance matrix, which also allows you to do dimensionality reduction. Um, before I come to that, I want to uh, also introduce an, a side variant of it, uh, which is quadratic discriminant analysis. In quadratic discriminant analysis, you also learn a covariance matrix per class. So in LDA, you learn a mean per class and the joint covariance matrix and in QDA, you learn a mean per class and also covariance matrix per class. So in QDA, you model each of the uh, each class as a Gaussian blob. Uh, here's an example from the Second Learn websites showing uh, when LDA and QDA work. So here, if you have two blobs that actually share the, the covariance structure, then LDA works well. And uh, QDA also works well, but QDA is more likely to overfit because it has more decrease of freedom. So QDA might not work as well in very high dimensions. Um, but if your classes have different covariances, so here one of the classes have blob in this direction, the other class have blob in this direction, because LDA assumes they have the same covariance structure, LDA is not doing such a great job, whereas QDA um, 
basically can model them each with their own covariance matrix. All right. So as I said, these are like very classical models. Um, I recommend you try to figure out the math behind them um, because they're, oh, can I go to, I was asked to go over the QDA formulation again. So again, so here, this is the LDA formulation at the top and this is the LDA formulation at the bottom. This is just the formula for Gaussian, right? This is the, a Gaussian density. So the probability of X given Y is a particular class is a Gaussian in both of them. But in the LDA formulation, um, each class has a separate mean vector, but they all have the same covariance matrix. So I fit a covariance matrix that fit, or I estimate a covariance matrix that fits all of them. Whereas in QDA, I estimate the mean for each class, but then I also estimate the covariance matrix separately for each class. So if you look at, in this picture, at the, these, these ellipses, they show the covariance of the data that is modeled by the classifier. And so you can see that here, um, even though the data, the classes have different covariance structures, basically the covariance structure that is modeled by the classifier is just the average of the covariance of this guy and this guy. Whereas in QDA, the covariance is more modeled separately so they can have different covariance structures. Um, so why did I talk about this here? So I, I, um, to me, this is very related to PCA in that uh, basically you're computing a Gaussian uh, fit to the data in both of these models. However, uh, PCA fits a Gaussian to the whole data set, while LDA uh, fits multiple Gaussians with a shared covariance matrix. So LDA is um, a supervised algorithm, it's a classifier, PCA is an unsupervised algorithm. But based, uh, once we have the covariance matrix, we can use LDA to also transform the space. Um, and so you can basically, yeah, th use the estimated covariance matrix, and then you, pr you can project onto the, um, the spaces spanned by the different means. And so um, this is something that I find very useful in, uh, for visualizing data sets. Um, and so that's like what, if you look at, at Dabble, that's one of the visualization it shows you and it usually works quite well. Um, so here, if you look at, um, at this data set that obviously, again, I constructed a little bit artificially. If you look at the original data set, um, so you have this structure where there's three classes and um, they all have the same covariance structure, and but um, they're very close together. If you fit PCA to this, PCA will basically not really do anything um, because PCA will fit a Gaussian block to the whole data set. If you um, fit LDA to it, linear discriminant analysis, then um, this is what happens. So the first discriminant analysis, uh, discriminant will actually, so the first dimension will perfectly separate the three classes. And the second dimension will then basically, um, yeah, uh, cover the rest of the variance in a sense. And so here, the first discriminant perfectly learned to separate the classes because it's a classifier and it can, can do that. Um, so you're putting more information into the um, into LDA um, because it's supervised, but I think it can give you much more um, interesting visualizations. And um, if you go to this example where I made PCA fail, LDA doesn't fail because it finds the direction that um, that separates the data. Okay. Um, just to summarize, so um, both P uh, PCA and LDA are good for visualization and for exploring correlations in the data. 
Um, PCA is unsupervised, so maybe it's the thing I would try first. If you can find a structure, even with an unsupervised model, it's probably going to be very obvious. Um, PCA can also help with classification uh, by using it to regularize or to feature extraction. Uh, generally, PCA is like maybe the go-to tool for exploratory data analysis. Um, like after I plot the raw data as good as I can, I will probably start doing PCA and look at the, what I call the explained variance and um, sorry, uh, look at the explained variance plot, um, look at the two-dimensional projection and so on. Um, so I have a question, to get the first discriminant, do we need to calculate the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix? Um, so we need to invert the covariance matrix, so you need to do an SVD of that, and then you base, so, um, sklearn does all of this for you, so you can just do lda.transform, but if you want to compute it yourself, um, this is what you need to do here. Uh, And so, uh, I mean, the, the expensive part of this is inverting the covariance matrix. Okay. So both of these techniques are uh, linear, which has pros and cons. So linear means we're doing a linear transformation of the data, which means it's like somewhat meaningful to understand what this means. I can. They, they are basically rotations of the data uh, of the data, and I have a good like mental model of what a rotation means. The thing we're going to talk about for the last ten minutes, um, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, sorry, I'm going to probably go over a little bit. Um, is uh, manifold learning. Manifold learning is um, also it's a family of dimensionality reduction techniques that are specifically usually used for um, visualization and for going to very low dimensions. So manifold learning te techniques are usually got done to go down to two dimensions to visualize, or maybe go down to three dimensions to visualize. Uh, PCA, as we saw before, maybe I can do like a 50 dimensional feature extraction or something. Um, you probably wouldn't use um, manifold learning techniques for this. Uh, manifold learning is really yeah, most commonly used for exploratory data analysis and visualization. Um, the idea of manifold learning is usually illustrated with this beautiful artificial data set called the Swiss roll. Um, so this is a dessert inspired algorithms. And um, so the idea is that your data set might live in a high dimensional space, but it's actually um, a lower dimensional manifold, meaning it's a lower dimensional space embedded in this high dimensional space. Um, this is sort of also the assumption PCA, but in PCA, we assume that this space is linear. In um, manifold learning, we assume this space can have an arbitrary shape. There, so there's, you can think of this as being like a ribbon of data or something like this, or a sheet that's in a higher dimensional space, um, and that all the data lives on this sheet, or maybe with a little bit of noise, and um, uh, you can tr want to learn what is um, how can I get the coordinates on this manifold? So how can I find where in this sheet of data it lives? Um, one example that is often given for this is um, images. Uh, so, oh, I mean, you could either think of MNIST or you can think of natural images. Um, natural images given of a f certain resolution, like um, let's say you have 100 times 100 natural image. Um, this has 10,000 dimensions, but if you look at all natural images, that's 100 times 100, clearly they're not, they don't span the whole uh, 10,000 dimensional space. A lot of these images don't correspond to natural images. A lot of them are like very noisy. Natural images have a lot of structure. And so some of the points we know, they are not, they don't correspond to natural images. And so one question could be, well, can we learn the subspace of natural images within this 
10,000 dimensional space? And can we recover the structure of that? Um, that's like a very hard, possibly impossibly hard problem, but this is the motivation. So in this two-dimensional Swiss roll example, sorry, three-dimensional example, um, maybe we have a chance of recovering this. So this is sort of the motivating example that people show. Um, so pros and cons of this. So usually these are, as I said, these are done for visualization only. Um, the axes don't correspond to anything in the input space. Because these are um, nonlinear algorithms, I can pl plot a 2D plot, but the X axis has no meaningful label. So in PCA, each axis is a linear combination of the original features. You could say, okay, understanding the linear combination of the original features is maybe like a little bit tricky to understand, but I can think of it as a line in the, like some vector in the original feature space. For manifold learning algorithms, there is just no correspondence. The number on the X axis has no relation, like there's nothing in the original data that corresponds to this. And so this means they have much less interpretable. Um, often they can also not transform new data, so they compute an embedding of um, your data set, but you can't apply them to new data, um, at least for some of them. Um, there's a whole manifold learning module in scikit-learn. Um, so there's kernel PCA, spectral embedding, local linear embeddings, uh, isomap, um, and TSNI. And um, all of these are like interesting algorithms, but I'm actually only going to go over TSNI because TSNI is quite established. And so you might see people using TSNI to uh, visualize the activations of neural networks or you, to um, visualize large text corpora or to visualize uh, word vector embedding. So we'll actually see a couple of TSNI visualizations later in this course. Um, so I'm thinking, so we don't have that much time and so I might skip the math of TSNI. Um, it's not that critical to understand the mass of TC, I think. Um, so I, I'm not gonna give you the intuition, but I'm gonna give you at least um, some important facts about it. Um, so basically the idea is that we're going from a high dimensional space to um, a two dimensional space. And so actually what it does is it initials it initializes the, uh, for each point in the high dimensional space, it picks at random a point in the two dimensional space. So you start off with a um, with random embedding of your data. So you just, each point has a random representation. In practice, you would use a PCA for initialization, but assume there's like a random point. Then you do gradient descent on these points such that um, if points are close in the high dimensional space, you move them close together in the low dimensional space. And so TSNI stands for T-Stochastic Neighbors Embedding. And uh, the name comes from the fact that it uses um, a student key distribution in the embedding space and, sorry, a student key distribution in the high dimensional space. Wait, wait, no, sorry. It uses a student key distribution in the low dimensional space and uses a Gaussian distribution in the high dimensional space. So it uses Euclidean distances in the high dimensional space and uses something else in the low dimensional space. But basically the idea is you do a random initialization of, picking po of just scattering the points in 2D and then if the points are close together in the high dimensional space, you move them closer together and you iterate this. And because it's this random initialization in the iterative procedure, you just end up with a bunch of points, but the axes are not meaningful. However, it gives you very pretty pictures. Um, this is the result of, on the digits data set. So this is like the built-in small digits data in scikit-learn. TSNI is also completely unsupervised. So this did not know that there's a concept of classes. It did not know that there's 10 classes or what these classes were. Uh, but I visualized the data, I projected the data to 2D using TSNI and then I colored them by the classes. 
And you can see that it actually did a very good job of separating the classes. Um, like the zeros over here, the sixes here, the sevens here. Um, the nines are a little bit uh, cut apart, but actually if you look at the numbers, you can see that um, the nines over here are the ones that have like a little hook at the bottom. And the nines over here are the ones that don't have the hook at the bottom. And you can see there's some ones over here that actually that have the hook at the bottom, so they look more like two, a little bit more like twos, and the ones over here, they don't have the bar at the bottom. And so actually, you can see sort of meaningful things from the structure of the data, uh, uh, in the structure of the data that the algorithm um, learned completely automatically. Um, and so this is why people really like this. It gets really pretty pictures, and uh, sometimes they correspond bunch of things that are actually in the data. However, it's like it's quite hard to debug this algorithm and like sometimes it just doesn't give you a good picture, but often it does. Oh, I just want to uh, compare this to PCA um, just as an, so if I, here I'm comparing uh, on the digits data set, uh, PCA on the right on two dimensions and um, TSNI, sorry, PCA on the left, TSNI on the right and um, you can see that, I mean, PCA already does some separation, but because PCA is uh, restricted in being linear, it cannot separate the classes anywhere as well as uh, TSNI does. Um, oh, the, the question is, does the random initialization mean there isn't a unique solution? Yes, exactly. So it's a, this is a non-convex optimization problem. So it's, and on which you do gradient descent. I mean, so this means like there's a random state. If you change the random state, you get a different solution. Um, this is different to PCA. And so actually PCA is usually used as an initialization. So you use, you don't actually use um, a completely random initialization. You use a random, an initialization based on PCA usually, and then you, uh, you start going on, but definitely there's, um, you can't compute the exact solution. Uh, to the problem. Okay, so here's a nice, uh, nice video from a tutorial that shows the optimization. This is actually, I think, I'm not sure if this is on the digits data set or on the MNIST data set. It looks kind of small, so it might actually also be a digits data set. So I get, gave a link at the bottom. Um, and you can see that basically everything, so here they used, um, completely random initialization, I think. And then you can see that the points are spread farther apart if they're apart in the original space and closer together if they're closer together in the original space. And uh, so then it converges to something. Okay, I'm a little bit over, but uh, well, I hope you don't mind. Um, I, I still wanna go over some things a little bit. So um, there's one parameter that's very important in TSNI, which is the perplexity. Um, So issue, um, sec. So um, this is intuitively sort of something like the bandwidth um, of the neighbors to consider. If you set complexity low, we'll only consider very close neighbors. If you set complexity bigger, we'll uh, consider further apart neighbors uh, also. And um, the authors of the original paper say 30 works well. In practice, 30 often works well. Um, if your um, data set is small, maybe try using a smaller perplexity. And so um, I'm not sure if I have the link to it, but there's actually a very good, oh yeah, there's a very good tutorial. Um, I don't know if you know, guys know this, uh, it's venue distill.pub. They have very cool, very nice visual papers. Um, and um, they have a, there's a very nice paper on TSNI um, uh, and how to tune TSNI. So I highly recommend that. Uh, finally, just very briefly, there's a couple of uh, newer algorithms. The downside of TSNI is that it can take a very long time. Um, and so um, there's a guy that 
called uh, Leland McInnes. He does a lot of really cool algorithms that have to do with graphs. And so uh, he had came up with this, well, now it's like maybe two and a half, three years old uh, algorithm, uh, UMAP. And uh, UMAP works completely different from TSNE, but also gives you pretty pictures with uh, axes that you can't interpret. Uh, but it runs much, much faster. So if speed is an issue, um, then uh, using UMAP might be, um, might be good. It's not as established yet, but I think some people in the GenX community really like it. Um, another competitor is LargeVis. Um, and LargeVis um, uses like um, an approximate nearest neighbor graph and has some other tricks in there that uh, allow it to be much faster than TC. But it, it's actually uh, uh, lots, large width is quite similar to TSNE and how it works. Um, yeah, and like people come up with, uh, with uh, these um, all the time, but I think so TSNE is sort of the one that is most established and but um, both UMAP and large width are like faster uh, versions and um, that might be good for bigger data sets. All right, um, that's it for today. Uh, and I'm uh, happy to take any questions. <laughs> okay, someone asked, can you go over the math behind TSNE, please? Okay, I'll stop the record. Um, okay, so this is this is bonus for people that want to so stay late. Um, okay, I, I'm gonna answer the other question first. Uh, if we run PCA with white and equal true, does it mean we scale the original data, do PCA, and then scale again? So basically, what white and equal to true does it basically is as if you do a pipeline of PCA and then standard scalar. It doesn't scale the input data. So you have to manually scale the input data, and um, so, which you should do probably. So you manually so you do standard scalar, and then you can do PCA. And if you do white and equal to true, it's equivalent to adding another standard scalar after the PCA. Okay, um, so if you want to hang around, uh, I can go over the mask behind TSNE. Uh, it's not going to be in the exam. Oh. Oh, so someone asked uh, when I talked about um, natural images manifolds. Um, it was unclear what I meant by natural images. Sorry, um, I've been doing computer vision for too long. So what I mean by natural image is, is a photo taken by a camera or a crop of a photo by, taken by a camera. So a natural image is a photo. Um, so not like an image could be an image is just a Gaussian noise that I plotted as an image, right? But I, I, with natural image, I mean like a photo that you could have taken with a camera. And not every, um, okay. Yeah, and so my point was that not every, not, not everything that you can uh, do uh, express as a 10,000 dimensional vector corresponds to an um, image you could take with a camera. And so they are clearly a subset of them. Okay, so um, why did I say that PCA fails here? Um, so basically, if you look at the, the plot of the variance, most of the variance is in the first two components, but actually I constructed the data set so that the third component is what classifies the data into uh, yellow and purple points. And so if you looked at uh, the, the variance explained, then the first two components explain all of the variance. 
However, if you project onto the first two components, you get this data set here. And this data set does not contain any information about the classification. So if you do PCA, project to two, di two dimensions, as like the logic behind PCA would suggest you do, and then try to learn a classifier, your classifier will utterly fail. Um, that's what I mean by PCA fails here. OK, I think um, I'm going to go over the, the, ma the math of TSNI, because otherwise people will ask me, can you explain this slide again for each individual slide? And I suggest you can uh, maybe go later over the video. And so um, I'll just briefly go over the math uh, of TSNI. So it's a little bit um, like a little bit heuristic. And uh, so the assumption is that we think of two probability distributions. Um, one is um, in the original space, and one is in uh, the new space that's, a two let's say, the two-dimensional space. It can also be sometimes also applied to three-dimensional space, but um, very commonly it's applied to two-dimensional space. So we have our axes here. The axes are um, the um, are the original data, and the y's are the randomly initialized uh, points in two D. And so we look at uh, the following quantity p of uh, j given i, which is supposed to encode um, something like it's a uh, something like a Gaussian density of um, picking a point, the point J randomly in looking at the neighbors of point I. So you're basically looking at like a Gaussian blob around uh, uh, around I and you look how much closer is j to i that, um, then all the other points are to i. And so this is a Gaussian density for uh, j centered around i and for all the other points centered around i. And you divide this, you normalize the upper one by the lower one. And so this is basically, yeah, this is, you can think of as a distribution over all the j's. If I pick randomly, um, by some, uh, if I pick randomly uh, a point around the, um, around I on a Gaussian, uh, with a Gaussian distribution, how likely am I to get point J? This also has this sigma I. Sigma I is um, something that is, uh, computed locally around uh, the data point uh, i is something like the local density is estimated. I don't have the formula for it uh, on this, but it's basically it's a relatively simple formula uh, um, that says um, how, how large is the neighborhood around i. Okay, so you have this quantity. You make this quantity symmetric by um, saying p i j is p of j given i plus p of i given j. OK, um, this now doesn't really have probabilistic interpretation anymore, but it's a way to make this thing symmetric in I and J. Um, and so you can think of this as being a value that is high if J and I are, much sim are very similar, uh, more similar than other points K. OK, and so now we do the same thing in the two-dimensional space. And uh, in the two-dimensional space, we don't use the Gaussian. We use the student t distribution. And this is the formula for the student t distribution. It's uh, 1 plus uh, yi minus yj. Um, so the distance between those square, uh, squared and then 1 over this. And so this is like a very peaky, long tail distribution, and not, not like the Gaussian. And basically what it says is that 
um, being picky means that in the embedding space, we only care about neighbors that are very close by. We don't care that much about what happens in the tails. Um, and then you again, in this case, um, um, compute this, this distribution, uh, basically. Um, because there is no sigma i, you don't need to make it symmetric. It's automatic symmetric. And um, so this basically says, if you take, pick a point i at random in the neighborhood of point j, or alternatively point j in the neighborhood of i, where points are distributed, um, if you pick among the neighbors with the distribution weighted by distance by um, the student t distribution, how likely is it that I pick a particular point j instead of another point k? Okay, so you have these two quantities. They basically say, if the quantity is high, then the points are similar. If the quantity is low, then the points are dissimilar. And they are between zero and one. Um, and so now you say, well, I want these, the distance me me measures in the original space and in the new space to be similar. If we think about these as distributions, a natural way to compute the distances between distributions is uh, called the Kohlberg Leibniz divergence. So Kohlberg Leibniz divergence is um, yeah, basically a standard measure of how different two uh, distributions are. It's an asymmetric measure, so um, the Kohlberg Leibniz of p and q, p given q is different from q given p. And so what we're computing is um, uh, this Kohlberg Leibniz divergence, which is um, the sum over all pairs of points um, that are not the same point, um, pij log pij divided by P I, uh, qij. So this probability times log of one probability divided by the other probability, that's the definition of the Kohlberg Leibniz divergence, and we just sum this over all the points, or all pairs of points. Uh, this is very expensive because it's over all the pairs of points, so it's like squared. Okay, so this is now a measure of how different the two distributions are. Um, so this distribution over like how neighboring two points are and this distribution of how neighboring two points are in the embedding space. And so we want this, this distance, this is a distance measure, we want this distance measure to be small. And so the, the TCN algorithm is do gradient descent on this quantity. So this is a loss function. We, the um, pij, we can just compute from the data. We compute them and then they're fixed. The qij, um, we um, initialize the yi, the y's randomly, and then I can do the gradient with of the uh, kohlberg leibniz divergence with respect to the y's, and then I do gradient descent, um, and the gradient descent moves around the, these, the points uh, y, so that uh, the kohlberg leibniz divergence is minimized. So the distance between the distributions is smaller. And this is what you can see in this animation is basically it's a gradient descent uh, where you adjust. So each point is one of the y's and you adjust it um, using gradient descent on this kohlberg leibniz divergence. And um, And that's how TSNI works. Um, I'm, I'm actually curious if this explanation helped at all or not, because I think it's like it's a it's quite an uh, okay. I think it's quite a a weird algorithm. Um, okay. So I have another question, and then we probably should finish. Uh, in PCA, if you just take the eigenvectors corresponding to the largest k eigenvalues. Is this equivalent to the iterative procedure you described um, repeating at k times? Yes. So if you do the iterative procedure, you would basically compute them once by one. Um, you can do the SVG and take the k largest eigenvectors, uh, k largest, the, sorry, the eigenvalues corresponding to the k largest eigenvalues. Uh, 
um, that's exactly the same. All right, um, gonna stop the recording here now. And um, by the way, uh, also uh, please feel free to leave any feedback here or in the class about um, anything that works or doesn't work for the remote lectures. Uh, I think that it seems to work quite well with the questions, but if you have any comments, please let me know.